Persist Grand Rounds, an online series of lectures hosted by Persist, covering topics related to advanced EEG analysis for improving outcomes in both neurocritical care and epilepsy monitoring environments. My name is Marie Carroll, and I am the Director of Product Management with Persist, here to introduce our speaker and topic for today's Persist Grand Round. Next slide. Thank you. Through our customers, we understand the importance of investing in the EEG community through education, where expertise and knowledge can grow towards the utilization and implementation of EEG and quantitative EEG. The goal of Persist Grand Rounds is to provide a platform for those with clinical expertise on topics of advanced EEG analysis as a way to connect with a broader community to share their expertise and knowledge so that we can all learn and grow together. Each online lecture features an experienced epileptologist or neurophysiologist presenting on a topic of their choice as it relates to EEG monitoring and analysis. Please visit www.persist.com slash grand rounds to keep up to date. The schedule will change. Next slide. The opinions and viewpoints of each speaker are solely their own and do not represent Persist or any other commercial entity or commercial interest. Speakers are not required to include Persist, its software, products, or services. The content presented was not prepared or edited by Persist. Persist is not providing any form of compensation. Next slide. This talk will last about 45 minutes and there will be time for questions after the talk. Please write your questions in the Q&A area. There is a button at the bottom of your screen. A recording of this webinar will be made available to all participants afterwards. And now I would like to introduce you to Dr. Edilberto Amorim a neurologist specializing in critical care and epilepsy. He treats patients with stroke, traumatic brain injury, coma, epilepsy, sleep disorders, and other critical illnesses. His expertise is neurointensive care, telemedicine, and multimodal brain monitoring with EEG. His fellowship was in neurocritical care and epilepsy at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital, followed by a postdoc fellowship in neuroscience and machine learning at Massachusetts General Hospital and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Amarim's research focus is coma neuroscience with interest in non-invasive and invasive EEG time series modeling and multimodal neuroimaging integration with EEG. He's board certified in neurocritical care and directs the epilepsy and clinical neurophysiology service at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Prior, he was faculty at Harvard Medical School and remains a research affiliate at MGH and the Computational Neuroimaging Group at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging. And without further ado, I present to you Dr. Amorim. Good morning, and thank you, Persis, for inviting me to talk today. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All right, very good. Just making sure, you know how it is with the pandemic and all the um, tele-talks we do these days. So as Marie mentioned, we're gonna be talking about neuromonitoring uh, broadly. The focus will be EEG, but we'll be discussing um, other topics as well as we expand the role of monitoring um, in the ICU. Those are my disclosures. Uh, this funding is related to um, cardiac arrest research and EEG research, but the sponsors have not participated on the development of this talk. I'll, before we start, I'd like to thank uh, the CCMRC and our collaborators that have contributed to data that we'll share today, in particular, Dr. Westover and Dr. Lee, who have been my mentors and got me excited about cardiac arrest research and quantitative EEG research, as well as Dr. Popescu at UPMC. So learning objectives. So there are uh, three main things we want to have as take home points today. So we talk a little bit about quantitative EEG and how which features might be helpful for prognostication as we advance research in this area. There's also pitfalls for interpretation of EEG that 
people should be aware. And we want to think about the neuroprognostication and management in a multimodal way. So how can we integrate different pieces of data to better care for patients and understand their disease process? The talk is gonna be divided in three parts. The first part is the longest one, and it's gonna focus on the coma dynamics. So how the EEG evolves over time in cardiac arrest. The second part will integrate a little bit of neuroimaging with the EEG data and figure out what is actually potentially an actionable type of information. And we'll finish the talk with future directions and some data on invasive neuromonitoring in cardiac arrest. So whenever you talk to cardiac arrest, specifically if you're not an EEG person, uh, people think of this, right? The ventricular tachycardia, fibrillation, shocking, um, return of spontaneous circulation. But there are also many brain rhythms associated with cardiac arrest. And some brain rhythms like birth suppression might indicate significant brain injury. You might have seizures, might have side effects from sedation, but there are also brain patterns that are associated with good outcome. They are benign that makes you more hopeful that that patient has a chance of recovery. And this is my slide to kind of summarize uh, numbers because a lot of people like tables with the percentages. And here we have several type of EEG patterns. And I have here on the left, the false positive rate. And this is for prediction of poor outcome. So if you have a flat EEG, your, for several days, uh, your chance of recovery is very uh, small. And here the study says 0%. Birth suppression is between zero to 5%, depending on the study and so forth. I think one thing that we need to keep in mind whenever we look at those type of summary slides is that there's a lot of self-fulfilling prophecy in cardiac arrest. So providers might become very pessimistic whenever they see birth suppression, whenever they see seizures, and that might contribute to withdrawal of life support. And there is bias on those studies. And what we're going to talk about today is a little bit on how can we think about the, those cases that might have a few percent chance of recovery, but their EEG data might help us understand if they might have a better chance of recovery than that. And one thing to keep in mind, and this is a study we are doing with the CCMRC, is that most patients actually, despite all the guidelines information, we are unable to provide a clear prognosis to families and to other providers. So. In this study, we have more than 500 patients all had EEG and MRI, so those are the more difficult to prognosticate cases. And you can see here that 176 are the cases that we, using guideline approach, that we could say this patient is going to have a poor prognosis. So the vast majority actually had an indeterminate prognosis, and we as clinicians still need to counsel families, we need to take care of patients, despite the patient not fitting the guidelines. Um, so I think that's a very important take home point here and why we need to look at things very carefully. And when we think about cardiac arrest, we think about multimodal prognostication. So it's not just about the EEG. And I, my practice has been to start EEG early and continue that for um, a few days so we can understand the evolution of the EEG data. But there are other pieces of information that are very helpful to put the picture and understand how much brain injury that patient had and what are the chances of recovery. So this is a case uh, that haunted me since I was a resident. So I'll tell you a little bit about it. So this is a middle-aged man, I think he was in his 40s and he was playing racquetball and then he collapsed on the floor. He got um, CPR in the racquetball court and this is his EG when he first got to the ICU. So he had a completely, near completely flat EG. You have on the top here the spectrogram, which shows a lot of blue, which indicates low power. And we have the raw EG here indicating a very suppressed EG. And that was the first uh, EG done early on in the first day. And here I have compressed on the top 24 hours of EG data. And you can see here on the spectrogram, there is a green that continues to go up over time. Right, so what that, that means, that means that the amplitude of the EG increase and the frequency of the EG increase as well. So it was completely flat and that evolved, as you can see here in the raw EG, some slowing. Um, and on day two, things got really uh, angry. You start to see here this red um, color on the left. Whenever you see a red 
um, in, going up in a spectrogram makes you think of seizures or epileptiform discharges. So this patient went into status uh, early on. And that was as soon as people decided to wean off the propofol to do an exam after the hypothermia uh, had um, resolved with the rewarming. So the propofol was put back on. And later on in the day, you can see here, there's some red flames towards the right side of the page. So that's when the patient had breakthrough seizure despite being on propofol. So he was had anti-seizure medications to start midazolam was started. And after some time, the seizures went away. And if you look at the raw AG here, there are a lot of um, spikes in the bottom is where the midline channels are. So they are maximal in the midline. And there is a little bit of background in between those discharges. And this patient was having myoclonus, very severe myoclonus. And this continued for several days. And he was starting on very um, intensive, four different seizure medications. And the team discussed with the family that, you know, this is not a good sign when people have seizures. But the family decided that, you know, we want to see what happened, just continue. And this patient had a good prognosis. Actually, the patient woke up and went back to work as an engineer. So what we see here is that this patient had a background despite having seizures. And this patient actually had a reactive EEG, not on the first day, but after. So we also need to look for the good prognosis signs on every case uh, and not just focus on the fact that he had a suppressed EEG that he had uh, malclonic status epilepticus. So what I suggest is for us to think about cardiac arrest and the EEG in cardiac arrest as an evolution of data over time and monitoring that evolution. So here in this plot, we have on the y-axis, the Glasgow coma score, and at eight, we have this line cutting off, which is kind of the waking up from a coma threshold, right? And we have in different colors here, different patient trajectories. So you can see here in the hypothermia phase, the EEG, the exam all looks very similar. Those patients are all comatose. They tend to have a slower suppressed EEG. But over time, the EEG might evolve in a trajectory of recovery or a trajectory of deterioration when the patient develops seizures or so. And you can see here that two examples who had a good outcome, some recover early in the normal thermia phase, but others might recover much later. And that's why we need to be careful interpreting EG data because we, if we withdraw life support early, we might not give people the chance to wake up. So we put together data for more than a thousand patients across seven hospitals in the US and Europe to try to better understand the EG of these patients. And we're using uh, advanced machine learning methods and deep learning, we we're able to label that EEG using those type of computational approaches. And what we found is that patients uh, who have a poor outcome tend to have much more generalized periodic discharges, you can see here in green. And patients with good outcome, they can also have generalized periodic discharges, but that's a much lower percentage. And actually the number of seizures was more or less the same between both groups. And we'll get into the details what might be helpful in differentiating those things. And generalized rhythmic delta activity was much more common in patients with good outcome. Importantly, more than 75% of the data or so is not those interictal continued um, type of patterns, right? And we still need to prognosticate on those patients. So we need to keep that in mind. And this is a little bit of a complicated um, plot, but I want to um, just give you the brief overview. So on the top, we have the evolution of EEG of patients with good outcome and in the bottom patient with poor outcome. And then we have the various types of icto interictal continuum patterns here. In green is the non icto interictal So you see most of the data is actually not icto interictal But what we see here is that the seizures, GERDA, GERDA showing yellow here, they increase in frequency over time, right? So if we look at the EEG very early, we don't see much of that, but that evolves over time. And you can see in orange here, seizures as well, even in the patient with good outcome. And what this plot shows from left to the right is the evolution from 48 to 72. So you can see that patients, they travel between colors, between positions in this plot over time. So there's a lot of moving around across the various icto interictal continuum patterns. And that's why EEG monitoring is very important. Sometimes the continuous EEG monitor can be very informative because it can notice and monitor this evolution between patterns, which might be actionable because patients might develop seizures. Patients might develop generalized periodic discharges. They are very high frequency. They are 
might be um, worth treating. So you can see here in the bottom, the patient with poor outcome have much more pink, which indicates GPDs. And that's really, really increases after 48 hours, especially when there's you know, the rewarming phase. So those are things for people to watch out. So just doing a short EG on the first day is probably not sufficient. You probably want to do repeated EGs if you're going to do routine EG and you cannot do or shouldn't do a continuous EG monitor. And this is a summary of that plot showing that patient with a good outcome, they might have seizures, but the seizures tend to evolve out of that state. They might have generalized poor discharges briefly, but that tends to evolve out of that state while patients with poor outcome tend to stay in the seizure state much longer, and they tend to stay on the generalized per discharge um, state much longer. So the duration on a state is also important. And this is a study from uh, Dr. Um, Richards and Dr. Van Putten's group in the Netherlands that I think was very informative. These patients all had status epilepticus. So we have here 47 patients and 10 had good outcome. And what's the difference between the EEG and those of two patients? So you can see here in green, that line indicates the continuity of the background. So patients had a very discontinuous background. You can see here the beginning of the green line is in the bottom. And over time on the x-axis, you can see that by 24 hours and especially by 36 hours, all those patients who had status um, had already a, a good background before the seizures start, right? Which is the orange line which was near 36 to 48 hours. Patients with a bad outcome had improvement of their background. You can see the green line also went up just like the good outcome group, but that went up much later. So early recovery of background is a really good sign, even if you develop seizures. So that's something to keep in mind whenever you're assessing the EEG of a patient and why if you only do the EEG two days later, you might lose this early information about the recovery of the EEG. And this is uh, unsupervised learning approach where we put those 1,000 patients I told you about, and each dot of this plot represents six hours of EEG. And the distance between dots tell us how different that EEG is. After we did this analysis, we put collars on those dots. And what we saw here is that patients who had a EEG that had epileptiform discharges or seizures, but had a high entropy background, so a high complexity background, had a chance of recovery of about 19%. While patients who had seizures and a low entropy background had a chance of recovery much lower at 8%. What does that mean? That the background information is very important independent of the presence of seizures or epileptiform discharges. You can see here that patients with birth suppression might also have a good outcome. So it depends on the timing of the birth suppression. We're gonna to talk to that uh, about that a little bit in a, in a moment. So this plot is just to show us that not all spikes, not all seizures are created equal. And if we need to really pay attention on the background. And this is that patient I told you about that had myoclonic status epilepticus. So he made to the news uh, in, our, uh, in our town when I was a resident. And this is just to sh show that those patients exist. So it, it's our job as clinicians, as researchers to figure out uh, what are the characteristics that might help us identify those type of patients. Another thing people talk about is birth suppression, right? So here is a patient who had a 17-year-old, had a cardiac arrest. The initial EEG, as you can see here, a lot of blue. So it was completely flat EEG. And by 21 hours, the EEG was still birth suppressed and only closer to 36 hours or so that the EEG became more continuous. And you can see here in the spectrogram, the evolution of that EEG. And by... 48 hours or so that patient woke up. That was the time that we turned off the paralytics and we turned off the sedation. So timing is really important, even for birth suppression. So not all birth suppression necessarily indicates a poor outcome. Most birth suppression does. And birth suppression that's present late is concerning for poor outcomes and severe brain injury, but early birth suppression, not necessarily. So we need to be very careful and look for the evolution of data. And here is a study from Dr. Elmer from the Pittsburgh group, which I think really highlights this very clearly. So his analysis, he summarized the trajectories of the birth suppression ratio for those patients. And you can see here that over time, patients who had a flat EEG, so near 100% suppression, and continued to have a, a flat EEG in the red line, all had a poor outcome. 
while patients who had improvement in the yellow and green group had a much higher chance of recovery. And again, this is just highlighting that even patients who have a suppressed versus suppressed EEG for a short period of time might recover. And the evolution of data is very important when we look at that data, interpret that data. And not all births are created equal. So Dr. Hoffmeyer and Dr. Van Putten's group, they look actually at the shape of those um, births and how similar those uh, births are. So if we compare the births on the top, they look very complex. And those are births that had a, a lot of variability on their cross correlation. So if you put the births on top of each other and you compare their shapes, their correlation is going to be all over the place here because they're very different, right? The bottom bursts there look exactly the same as what they call the identical burst. And that's why the correlation here on the right is all near one. So those bursts are indicative of more severe brain injury. And near all patients who have this pattern will have a poor outcome. There are some case reports coming up now that the, not all patients will have a poor outcome, but those seem to be rare patients. So it's about the birth suppression evolution, but also potentially about the birth suppression uh, shape. One thing to keep in mind in the, when you talk about identical births, you're actually only looking at the first 500 milliseconds. So whenever they do the calculations and compare the correlation between those signals, they're only considering the very beginning of the burst. So we don't look at the entire burst. If you do that, actually the correlation is harder and you don't have as, as good of a predictive value. One thing to keep in mind is also this is done with the aid of a computer, right? Their, their algorithms helping us do these calculations. So the eyeball test perhaps might not be as um, good at those computational calculations. That's something that is going to be, it uh, is being, actually um, assess right now. The initial results indicate that visual review might be good in determining those identical bursts, but that's something that we still need to study a little more. So when we think about uh, quantitative EEG and all those um, algorithm tools and machine learning tools that are being developed, we want to build this new software, this new brain monitor, that actually integrates imaging, electronic health records, medications to provide a more clear picture about what's happening to the patient. So for example, here in this mock-up, and this is doc done by Dr. Gassemi, who is now a professor of computer science at Michigan State and was working with me when I was at MIT. And we have here, based on our data, kind of an algor algorithm that predicts the probability of recovery based on the EEG. And on the bottom, we have the raw EG data because clinicians want to see the raw EG data. You just don't want to see a number from an algorithm most of the time, right? We want to make sure you trust that number. So this patient here had a flat EG early on. You see a lot of blue, the left and right hemisphere. But over time, the EG improved. You start to see a little bit more of yellow, a little bit of improvement on the background, the power and the frequency. And the algorithm here, those little dots, predicted a poor outcome initially, because AG was flat. But as AG got better, the algorithm noticed that. And the probability outcome went from like 10%, 20%, all the way to 50% or so. But over time, the AG did not keep getting better. You see here how the band continued that yellow on the delta range. And an EG that doesn't improve over time is concerning, right? So the algorithm noticed that and made a prediction that the outcome is most likely not as good as you thought it would be at 24 hours. And this is just to highlight that the data is dynamic and those predictions are dynamic. Just like us clinicians, we watch patients and how they are doing over time. Algorithms also need to do the same. And I think that's the direction we want to go with the technologies we are working on. So the first part of the talk, we highlighted how the evolution of data is very important in cardiac arrest. But what about other data? Is this data actionable? So here I have the imaging study of a patient with a cardiac arrest who had an overdose. And here's the MRI. You can see here there is significant injury, all these bright areas. We did a quantitative map of the brain injury on the MRI. You can see here the dark purple indicates injury. And this patient had a global uh, injury. You compare that with a normal diffusion, what it would look like, and you can see that that's a bad looking brain. 
But when you look at the CT data for that patient, when they first got to the emergency room, his head CT was actually normal. And you look here, his head CT at 72 hours, and there is already diffuse edema. You can see here the gray-white differentiation on the initial scan, and that really went away completely on uh, 72 hours. But um, the MRI also shows here diffuse injury. You see the bright areas, especially here in the back of the brain. So when you see that type of data, say, wow, this is really severe injury. And perhaps the initial CT was just done too early and you couldn't tell that the injury was uh, already irreversible from the get-go. But when you look at the EEG data for that patient, actually the EEG looked pretty good early on. And over time, that EEG deteriorated. What, that makes me think that perhaps the brain injury was not already complete uh, early on and that the secondary injury, the injury that happens over time after a cardiac arrest from caused by the initial insult might be playing a role. And that perhaps there's something we can do as epileptologists, as intensivists to prevent that injury from progressing. So here we have a summary of a brain MRI uh, across several patients that we took care of in our hospital. We're starting to do now quantitative maps as part of our um, monitoring of those patients. And you can see here in yellow, there's a lot of brain injury affecting, especially the posterior part of the brain, uh, the temporal lobes, and the motor strip coming up. We had a paper that we, we just got out uh, by Dr. Snyder and Dr. Lee um, last week in neurology, highlighting this pattern of injury after a cardiac arrest. So while we say that there's diffuse injury in cardiac arrest, there's also specific topologies that might be indicative of worse outcomes. And that's why we see that this posterior type of injury is worse. And here we have a comparison between uh, patients with a good and poor outcome on that group that I just showed you. And you can see here, patients with a good outcome might have some brain injury. We can see here motor strip, cerebellum, but patients with a poor outcome tend to have a much more diffuse type of injury, especially involving the occipital poles. So that's another piece of information together with the EEG that might be helpful. And here we have the combination of EEG and MRI data. So this study done by Dr. Lee a few years ago with Dr. Beavers has looked at the evolution of the ADC data. So you can see here, if you do the MRI early on, um, that might not be very helpful. And here's the variability of ADC right on the y-axis. So if you do too early, you might not see injury. You know, a, a normal brain has a high ADC. But when you look from day two to five, you have that um, injury better characterized. And if you look that later, the diffusion signal might go away and you have a pseudo normalization. Therefore, uh, there's a sweet spot when we look at the MRI data on those first few days. And there is a cutoff. So patients with a good outcome they usually don't have any injury on the MRI. And if they do, that tend to be very small. So you hear 4% of the brain was injured below the 650 cutoff in the good outcome group. While patients with a bad outcome tend to have a much higher degree of injury. The average was about 16%. And one thing to keep in mind is actually patients with this bad looking EGs with seizures or GPD, zicto, interictal, continuum patterns, they actually didn't have an MRI that looked that bad. So, there's a mismatch perhaps sometimes when it comes to the bad looking EEG, when it comes from a seizure perspective and the MRI. And actually the background is what really uh, tell us a lot of the story here. I don't know why I cannot get this thing to disappear from the screen, but um, patients with high birth suppression um, height ratio, so patients with a flat EEG tend to have a much more severe brain injury. You see here that in average, patients with a birth suppression ratio in around 80% in this cohort had more than 30% of the brain injured, while patients that had a continuous EEG had very little of their brain injury. But remember, those are all patients with poor outcome that I'm showing to you here, and this is a cohort of near 100 cases. Patients with a good outcome, they tend to have a continuous EEG. So what I'm showing here is a lot of patients might have a continuous EEG and not have that much brain injury and they still have a poor outcome, which indicates there's a lot more information going into defining what the outcome is going to be. 
But if you do have a flat EG, a birth suppression for a long period of time, that is a sign of more severe brain injury. Very few patients, you have your only two patients with a 80 to 100% birth suppression, and that was done early on, and more than 50% birth suppression ratio, just like four patients. So there are very few patients who might have birth suppression and not have that much brain injury in the MRI and have a good outcome. But those are the minority, and that's why the evolution of the data like we talked about just a few minutes ago is very important. And the identical births, they also relate to the MRI injury and also the timing. So you see here on the y-axis, the measure of how identical the births are. So the lower the number, the most identical, the worse they are. And you can see here over time that the birth suppression ratio information and the identical birth information was correlated to brain injury on MRI especially early on. So the early data of the EEG about birth suppression was really informative because many patients, their uh, background is going to get better over time if you wait long enough to get an EEG, right? Which highlights how early data is really helpful to help us understand which patients might have a better potential to recover, even when we look at identical births. What about seizures and brain injury on the MRI? So I just told you that a lot of patients who have seizures might not have that severe of a brain injury. So that's a case I took care of about a year ago in our unit. And you can see here the now classic occipital injury and the motor strip injury that we talked about. And we can see here that this patient had status epilepticus early on, and we started treating that. You can see here how that evolved to birth suppression whenever the patient was started on propofol and actually had ketamine started. But when you look at the pattern early on, whenever, right before he started having seizures, his EEG actually didn't look that bad. You can see how continuous, how much high frequency elements we see on that EEG. That patient had what probably was a reactive EEG, was a little hard to tell. So how do you reconcile a good EEG background and status and that MRI with significant degree of injury, and especially the occipital type of injury that's concerning uh, for worse type of outcomes. So this patient ended up having life support withdrawn despite having uh, seizures treated for three days with um, anesthetics. So we'll never know if we kept treating if this patient would recover or not, um, and to what type of recovery that patient would have, right? Because in this case, um, the family decided that we should not keep trying because this patient valued being independent um, and he would not want to risk that he would perhaps survive the cardiac arrest and the seizures, but be debilitated. So that's where the withdrawal of life support plays an important role, especially on those patients with very severe marks of injury. And here's another patient with myoclonic status epilepticus. And when you look at the initial head CT, well, maybe there is some gray white matter, matter differentiation blurring here. Maybe there is significant injury. The EG wasn't reactive early on. Um, but when you look at the, in this patient cap seizing, the MRI actually looked pretty good. So injury that's seen on the EG right? We are seeing seizures might not necessarily translate to the MRI. And, and that's one of the take home points here and why multimodal prognostication is really important. We really want to look at the data all together. And when we look at the literature, uh, when it comes to seizures and nictoreterectal continuous is bad, right? If you look at this study here uh, from Dr. Westhall and the TTM group, all those GPD seizures were associated with poor outcome, um, you know, 100% in the seizure case. But we need to remember that we are looking at 100 cases um, out of the almost 1,000 cases on the TTM group, and 16 patients had seizures. Um, so we, we are now looking at a large number of patients with seizures, and that's why I think it is important for us to continue to try to build this collaborative studies so we can get more of those cases together and we can better understand who are the patients with seizures that perhaps survive. The study I showed you from the Netherlands group had about 10 patients who survived um, status epilepticus. This study from Italy showed that uh, 36 patients had status epilepticus and almost half of them 
um, had a good outcome. So most patients will not have a good outcome. 44% might be too optimistic, um, but it's probably not zero. So I think that's why we need to be very careful about interpreting that data and deciding which patients might be worth treating. And one thing that I think is very helpful um, in assessing potential for recovery is EEG reactivity. So here we developed this algorithm that actually computes the EEG data before and after you have a stimulus. And you can see here in this patient who had a flat EEG despite stimulation, the algorithm detected that there's no change on the EEG and that the chance of good outcome was very low, near zero. While in this patient, they had a very clearly reactive EEG on the raw EEG and on the spectrogram here in the bottom, the algorithm detected a chance of recovery being um, very high. So this other patient here had a change. You see how there's suppression of the EEG after stimulation? This was clapping. So even decrease in activity might be a good thing. And the algorithm wasn't uh, perhaps as good uh, identifying that or identifying that as a sign of recovery. And that probability of recovery was detected at 0.7 on this case. Um, because the algorithm thinks that just EEG that gets faster is a sign of a good outcome. But no, even if your EEG has suppression with stimulation, especially auditory stimulation, in my experience is when we see that with the suppression of the EEG, that might actually be a good sign. So that's uh, something to keep in mind when you look at the EEG um, reactivity assessments. So the final part of the talk is going to be focused on invasive brain monitoring. So what can we do beyond EEG and imaging as we discussed? And there are very few centers around the world doing this. And one of the leading places is in Vancouver where they're using a multimodal boat to monitor oxygen, intracranial pressure. There's microdialysis, uh, serial blood flow. They're also using a jugular venous catheter as well to look at the oxygenation of the brain more globally. And actually, this is the first time this happened. We had a case in my hospital that one of the intensivists placed a monitor recently. And what we see here is the raw EEG for that patient. That was a young woman who um, had hanging and had a cardiac arrest after that. And you can see here that early on, the EEG showed um, some slowing and there's some overriding fast activity on that slowing. And early on, there's also burst compression. So the EEG went from completely flat to several seconds, you are not really burst off this delta with overriding fast activity. And that evolved within the first day. On the day two, we start to see some of that activity continued. And then we start to see some sharp waves coming in. There's some sharply contoured activity, rhythmic activity on that EEG. And on day four, that EEG become more flattened. So you lost some of that fast activity and you see more slowing here. And interestingly, the intracranial pressure for that patient also evolved that way. So on day one, the ICPs were low and the PRX, which is, looks at the correlation of the blood pressure and the ICP. So if your blood pressure goes up, even ICP goes up, that's bad. That means that your brain cannot regulate the amount of flow coming to the head. So if we all exercise, our blood pressure is going to go up and our intracranial pressure is not going to go up because we can auto-regulate. But when you have brain injury, you might lose that. But early on, this patient actually had a good um, measure of auto-regulation. But on day two, we start to see loss of that. You can see here the PRX and the correlation is almost one which is bad. You can see here the orange curve going up and the ICP here going up, hitting 54. And that's happening on day four. So early on, that patient had a decent EEG. There's auto regulation seemed to be okay. But on day, day two, day three, day four, you can clearly see a rapid deterioration. And one thing to keep in mind is that blood pressure um, is something that we often say, you know, if the map is above 65, we're good. But now that we have the intracranial pressure, we can see that the, even though the map was 65 here on day one, the brain, the cerebral perfusion was, was low, below 60, which is our goal, right? And if we don't have intracranial monitors, we would not know that the ICP was high and that there's loss of autoregulation and we'll keep that blood pressure low 
when actually the patient needed a blood pressure of, in the map in the 80s, the 70s to actually have a good cerebral perfusion. And the EEG or the imaging um, showed some gray white matter differentiation um, issues early on on the initial CT done a few hours after the arrest. But by day two, there was already diffuse edema and the patient herniated by day three or so. You can see your diffuse injury and the MRI also shows diffuse brain injury. So that's just to show that the EEG evolved um, and the imaging evolved with it. And there are metrics of autoregulation and how the brain is working that also evolved with that. And while the EEG looked um, relatively benign early on and the autoregulation was good early on, that rapidly changed. So perhaps there is a window of opportunity for us to aggressively treat these patients early on so we can help them recover and prevent this type of edema, this type of injury that happened afterwards. This is another study out of the Penn group where they had a little over 30 cases. And you can see here that patients with a good outcome tend to have a low ICP. There are a few patients with a bad outcome that might have a high ICP, but those are few patients. Um, but the autoregulation was really different. So that might be a sign of um, severe brain injury, something that we can monitor early on if there is invasive brain monitoring. Again, I'm not saying here that we should be putting bolts on every patient with a cardiac arrest that come into the ICU, but it, without the boat, this physiology is present. And right now we are just not tackling it head on. We are not adjusting our early intensive care treatments to those patients who are brain injury patients early on. So perhaps there are interventions that we could be providing to patients to improve outcomes that we won't know just because we don't have the data available. And here on the right, we have the oxygenation data, which was not that different. And here is the results for the Vancouver group. And again, this is a very small number of patients who had invasive monitoring, but patients who had goal-directed care based on this multimodal data. So if your ICP was high, they will treat that. If your oxygen in the brain was low, they will treat that. They, they, had, they tend to have a better outcome than patients who had the standard of care. So you can see here, nine patients had a good outcome, so they were independent. Um, while only three patients on the standard of care group had a good outcome. So we had 21 patients on the standard of care and we had 21 patients on the invasive multimodal monitoring group. So small study, food for thought, but just indicates that perhaps there are things we can do to that early EEG data, this invasive physiology data to improve patient outcomes. So when we talk about cardiac arrest, we talk about the chain of survival. So if someone has a cardiac arrest, you gotta call 911, we've gotta start a CPR, defibrillate the patient early and do the post resuscitation care. There's a continuum of care. You need to do every step of the chain for patients to have a good outcome, right? So if you, have a, if you do a poor job calling for help and doing CPR, all the other steps might not matter. So everything needs to work together. And when it comes to cardiac arrest, the patients who make to the ICU and survive, we're really talking about brain injury. Most of the, you know, more than half of the patients who die, um, who are patients who get to the ICU die because of brain injury, right? So we need to look at all the different aspects of prognostication and patient care. We need to look at the icto interictal the seizure data, the birth suppression continuity, presence of reactivity imaging markers. So if you only focus on one thing, you might miss important information that is gonna be very important to deciding on how to tailor the care of that patient. So that's one of the take home points I want to have uh, to you today that we need to really look at all the data available. And sometimes they might mismatch. The EEG might look good and the MRI look bad or the EEG looks bad, but the MRI looks good. And we need to make a very individualized decision about the care of that patient. And I'll be welcoming questions on the Q&A. Thank you again for um, listening to me early in the morning here in California, but perhaps very late in the day if you're out in Europe. And, uh, and thank you again, Persis, for having me present some of my, our research and the data in neuromonitoring in cardiac arrest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amarim. That was a great talk, very interesting. Um, we do have some questions that came in, so um, I can read them to you if you don't mind, and then we can get some answers. So the first one uh, came in uh, from Marcus 
Gushwin. I'm probably not saying that last name correctly. Uh, thank you for your talk, very helpful. How many channels do you typically use on your ICU monitoring EEG? 1020 system or more or less? And do you think it's important at all? How many times do you stop by the patient in the ICU in order to make sure that the EEG is running properly? That's a very good question. And actually there's a lot of, um, a lot of data coming up on that. So when it comes to cardiac arrest, most of the patterns I showed you are generalized patterns, right? We see a lot of generalized seizures, GPDs, GERDA, slowing continuity, and you don't need a 1020 system to detect those things, right? So um, my practice is to do 1020. That's why we do our standard of care for EG monitoring here. We have the luxury of having EG techs that can play CGs during the day or during the weekend sometimes, but that's not the case everywhere. And there are several studies looking at this four electrodes, uh, eight electrodes montages, and they work pretty well. I think the, the loss of data from having a more sparse montage in cardiac arrest, uh, at least for the standard type of things we look for, right? We're only looking for seizures, background. We're not doing like fancy connectivity analysis, which can be helpful for prognostication. There is some data on the research side on that, but from day-to-day -day monitoring, a uh, few electrodes tend to be sufficient for most patients. And that's potentially what can help monitor more patients. So there's a study from a couple of few years ago now showing that it's like 5%, less, less than 10% of cardiac arrest patients actually get EEG monitoring, right? So I'd much rather have few electrodes and more people than only have the nice 1020 montage and few patients. So I think that's... Uh, an important uh, thing to keep in mind. Um, Very good, thank you. Um, oh, next, oh, go ahead, just real please. quick, I apologize. I think there's another question about how often do you check on the EEG? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. So I think that really depends on your setup. So if some places they have uh, EEG techs who monitor the EEG, and I find that very helpful um, for communication about something changed, the EEG is getting worse. Um, so as an epileptologist, we tend to look at the EEG depending on how worried you are, right? So if you have someone that's some seizures, the EEG is getting worse, you might be checking on it every few hours. If you're titrating anesthesia, um, you might want to be checking the EEG every hour. For example, we had this case that um, was very difficult to treat status. Um, we had the patient with propofol, ketamine, and all of a sudden he started to get responsive. And all of a sudden, his EEG got pretty flat pretty fast in a few hours. Mm -hmm. So if we're not keeping an eye on the EEG, that patient will be overly sedated. So that's why you need to keep an eye on things because things might change in how responsive mm -hmm. the patient is, especially when the seizure drugs catch on, especially when you start to break the seizures, right? It might be very, be very difficult to control early on, but then after you control them better, they might actually be responsive. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And one of the things we're doing in our hospital is actually train the nurses to review some of the EEG data, especially the type of quantitative panels. In our, our shop, we're using Persist for that type of monitoring. And we taught the nurses, and we had residents and fellows as well. And we even had a paper a few years ago on that. We did a 45-minute training of nurses to recognize seizures. And their sensitivity was comparable to the epileptologist on the test. Right, so even though they're only uh, looking at 45 minutes of data, of course, they had more false positives. Things are not seizures, and they're only looking at quantitative panels, not at the raw data. But you can see how that could perhaps be very helpful when you're monitoring 10, 15 patients, and that also empowers the nurses with narrow data. Right, just like just imagine taking care of blood pressure, and only the doctors needs to look at a monitor to decide what the blood pressure is going to be to decide if the drugs need to go up or down. I would never sleep, right? So, but now the nurses can titrate their blood pressure medication and that's standard of care, right? Mm -hmm. We're not there yet for brain data, EEG data or seizure management. But if we're saying that our goal is birth suppression at 70% and we can titrate the propofol to that, I think the future is to empower not just the epileptologist to be making that call, mm -hmm. but the intensivists, the physicians and even the nurses, perhaps when we have a, a very clear goal, just like they do for other type of therapies. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you.
So the next question is from David Groffey. How do you get the quantitative maps of MRI abnormalities? Yeah, so we develop, um, you know, in partnership with our radiology colleagues, we develop some code that gets the raw data and creates those sample maps. And we are not using that for clinical care. We are doing that. That's a kind of a research tool that we have available for people to look at. But that does really help, especially if you're not a uh, very experienced radiologist, um, catch some of those changes and gives you a percentage, gives you a more specific map about where the lesions are, are and how severe they are. If you look at the inter-rater re reliability, actually, between radiologists, between what's mild, moderate, and severe, that might not be as, as good as we think. You know, everyone is very good about normal uh, MRI. People are very good about their really bad MRI that the whole brain looks bright. But whenever it's in the middle, there is a lot of variability on that scoring. So I think that's where quantitative type of maps like this can be very helpful. And they are standard of care for stroke, right? So patients that come with an occlusion, we look at the perfusion maps to decide if they're going to have a thrombectomy done or not. Of course, there's some research saying that maybe those maps are not necessarily that helpful. You just need to take people to for the procedure most of the time anyways. But if we we use that routinely, so I think uh, cardiac arrest, this type of quantitative maps can also in the future, hopefully be used, um, but they're only gonna be used if we clinicians ask, ask for them, right? So mm -hmm. if we talk to the companies that create those maps that not just stroke patients should be getting them, but other type of patients. But to answer those, your question, we have software engineers that develop those codes with our physicians who are physician scientists mm -hmm. to create those type of maps. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question from Hanan El Shakankiri. Does stimulus-induced seizure also considered a sign of reactivity? So That's a very good question. Um, so the way I think about this is that if you have a flat EG, that is bad. Um, if you have seizures, that's probably better than having a flat EG. You know, it's not good, but it's probably better. Your brain is doing something. And the same thing goes for reactivity. There's a study from Dr. Rossetti's group um, recently looking at that, that people with stimulus-induced discharges might be better off than people who have an unreactive EG. So, of course, the ideal reactive EG is a benign-looking EG that gets faster, um, but having stimulus-induced discharges or even seizures might not be as bad as you might think. Hmm. Still okay. not a good thing, don't get me wrong, but I think it might not be as bad. Better than flat, yeah. Um, okay, Bradley Beauchamp asks, is there a reason why the motor strip and occipital regions are first most affected by HIE? And do those regions show any focal anomalies on EEG or QEEG? Again, another very good question. You know, EEG, unfortunately, uh, because of the inverse problem, we cannot often in the 1020 montage get very specific about what regions of the brain are being affected. If you do some more fancy analysis, you might be able to, but on the eyeball bedside test that we do every day when we take care of patients uh, is not as straightforward. You know, those are patients who have very diffuse injury, even though they have a more severe injury in those regions. So the EEG signatures tend to be very diffuse. I think as we are progressing, and this is new information coming out of recent studies we are doing, we might be able to get to detect those focal abnormalities, especially mm -hmm. when we use quantitative type of metrics. So I think mm -hmm. that's something that we are working on now. And that's why I'm very thankful for the support I've received through those um, grants, and because that's the type of thing we want to do. So we can bring kind of a more precision approach to both EEG monitoring and patient care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, we have a, a question from an anonymous attendee. This also raises, raises the question of whether we should consider GPEDs and GPDs as subclinical seizures or just a pattern seen in anoxic injury. Absolutely, and that's one thing that's very important to highlight. So patients who have a suppressed EEG and GPDs, those patients tend to, near all have a poor outcome, right? While the patients that have GPDs and the background 
not all have a, a good outcome. So that's why I mentioned that the continuity of the background, the entropy of the data might be helpful in trying to differentiate these patients that not all GPDs are created equal. The tricky part here is that those patients are all getting sedation, right, which makes your EEG flat, which might be contributing for us to miss uh, label a patient that has, has a flatter EEG than they would if they didn't have sedation on board. So it can be very tricky, but in my practice, those patients who have a suppressed EEG, a flat EEG with GPDs on top tend to be patients that do not uh, recover. Mm -hmm. um, so, and when we do it, did our quantitative analysis, so we did this you know, deep learning approach that characterizes the background uh, with us, you know, help with Dr. Westover's group on this. Um, actually, it's very difficult for the algorithm to figure out the GPDs from the seizures. And whenever we did the spike count on top of those deep learning metrics, is that we were able to kind of tell them apart because it's all about the frequency. And maybe a GPD and seizure is all in the continuum and is a very kind of arbitrary um, characterization that we experts create that might not translate the physiology on those patients. So it's all a continuum. And if it's two hertz is a seizure or two and a half or three, it's kind of hard to tell um, in real practice. We agreed on two and a half on the last latest guidelines, but that might depend. And that's where in those invasive monitoring could be helpful, right? If you have a two hertz GPD, but your glucose is going down in the brain, if your oxygen is going down whenever the GPDs get fast, perhaps that can be causing brain injury and we should uh, handle and attack that. Mm. Often we don't have that data available. So we, don't we cannot make that nuanced decision sometimes. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, David Benezra asks, I have seen an increase in the use in limited montage EEG devices in the ICU like Cerebell. Given how difficult in, given the difficulty in determining prognostication with a full 1020, are we decreasing our usefulness by using these devices? Well, I think in my practice, uh, is difficult if you have one channel, two channels, 10 channels, 60 channels. Um, there's a very, is very tricky. Um, and what we are finding is that few channels might be good for a lot of the prognostication. It might allow us to do more continuous. As I showed you, the recovery is often, there's a lot of change on the EEG sometimes. And that's those type of changes, not just uh, which, cha you know, a change might be helpful, right? If you go from birth suppression to continuous, if you have seizures, but you go back to a high entropy EG, those things may be helpful. So I, I'm hopeful that more continuous EG is better. Of course, we need to think about cost. Um, and the majority of patients um, that might not be helpful, but it might be helpful for the few patients that have this more nuanced change that might be actionable. So I think that's why I'm a proponent of using continuous EG, but it's understandable not to do so. And a lower montage EG, I think might be very helpful, especially for increased access to monitoring. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. early EG seems to be very helpful for prognostication. If we wait two days, three days to put EG on, we might lose actionable information. And two, we might lose actually even the prognostic part and how much your brain is recovering. The faster you bounce back to those better looking EGs, the better. Mm -hmm. Even a bad brain is gonna bounce back to a better EEG a lot of the time. You know, remember 75, 60% of the EEGs are not flat, are not um, seizures or GPDs. So there's a lot of slowing in the brain that is kind of hard to separate patients with good and poor outcome. And that's why there's so many patients with indeterminate outcomes in this population. Mm. So I think that's where the evolution of the background might be helpful and early monitoring might be helpful. Mm. That's a great segue to the next question. Uh, Deepak Nair asks, thoughts on how to minimize false positives, falsely proclaiming poor prognosis in this population? Absolutely. I think that's what, you know, sometimes we have trouble going to sleep, right? We have these patients that they, EG is kind of borderline and I'm not sure what to do. There are some people that are very pessimistic in the team. There are some people that are not that pessimistic and pessimism spreads, right? So if you get pessimistic, Early on, guess what? People, everyone around is going to be pessimistic. So if you put someone with a label of poor outcome very early, um, that might be really backfire. And how we talk to families, 
and how we present information to families when we don't have enough information. So I think the most important thing to avoid false positives is to record the data and understand the data early on, but put that into context and really have more data available to make those type of decisions. Mm -hmm. I think combining information, the multimodal approach is very important, right? So patients with seizures might have a bad looking MRI, but they might have a decent looking MRI. It doesn't mean that they're gonna have a good outcome if they have a good MRI, but that should make you pause and make you assess what other information is going on. SSCPs can be helpful um, as well. Um, and they have a very low false positive rate. In the US, we use very little SSCPs, while if you go to Europe, they use that much more. And I think that can be a very um, helpful tool. It's not a perfect tool, there's issues with interpretation, there's artifacts, and people might say, oh, this is a absent N20 case, and the patient might have had some degree of response. Maybe the degree of the N20, you know, the amplitude matters on prognostication. So there's a lot of nuances that people that are, are not as experienced might not be attentive to that might impact patient outcomes. So I think another thing that's important to decrease false positive rates is to have a team of people who are experts in intensive care, or they are consultants that do a lot of those monitoring and prognostication cases because experience is really important. If you have someone that's only on service a week a year and they only see like two cardiac arrest patients a year, they might be very pessimistic because they don't see enough cases to see the patients who actually get better and right. see those corner cases. They are more complex and more nuanced. So I mm. think that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. That's great. Um, these questions are fantastic and your responses are brilliant. Um, we could have a separate recording just with the Q&A. I wanna be mindful of time. It's two minutes past the hour. So I wanted to check in with you. We still actually have quite a few questions to get through. They're all very good. So we can continue. Um, or if, uh, if we're running short on time, then we can follow up after and um, send responses to the individuals that ask. What's, what's your time? Yeah, I'm all yours. I, I had a okay, 9 a.m. meeting, but I pushed that to 9.30 yesterday Perfect. so to make Let's sure we have going. time. Great. We still have many participants online, so I think there's still a lot of folks that are quite engaged in the conversation still, as am I. So, okay. The next question then is uh, Chiara Prosperetti, and they ask, do you think that continuous monitoring is better than daily EEGs to check the evolution? Yeah, so I think it really depends. Um, the evolution happens independent of the time we put the EG on in the patient's head, right? So, um, and there might be information that we might miss. You know, if you look at the quantitative analysis, you know, we didn't have time to go. I didn't want to make you talk too much of a machine learning heavy, but if you look at the data um, and the quantitative piece of that, actually most of the data on the cardiac arrest patients is stationary. So if you just calculate the change between every hour and all those different features, you know, 60 to 70% of the data is actually not changing. So you could argue that there's no point of doing a continuous EEG, right? Because if the data is not changing, why you need to do it? But it might change in a specific times, right? And to catch that, the right time, it might be different from patient to patient. Um, so I'm not, and as I mentioned, I'm not here that to say that continuous EEG is the way to go. It's all about your resources. It might, is expensive to do continuous EEG. It's mm -hmm. very labor intensive, right? It's difficult to get tax. It's difficult to get tax coming at 2 a.m. to fix EEG leads. You know, I do a, a lot of quantitative EEG analysis and there's a lot of bad EEG data because, you know, the patients are being moved in the ICU. Um, so it's not easy to do continuous EEG and it's very labor intensive. But I think, at least in my practice, I've benefited of having this overview of the evolution of the data mm -hmm. and how things are changing. The reactivity assessments, right? These patients change over time and there might be differences in reactivity based on the sedation and all the other things that are going on. Yeah. Some of those patients are on ECMO, right? So those patients are sedated and they're multiple things happening on that patient. So coordinating when you do the EG, that might, what might be the best time is also not straightforward. So sometimes doing continuous EG is actually easier because you don't need to get the tech to spend the full, you know, 20, 30 minutes setting things up and coordinating with the team about when to set things up. So it takes a while to put the EG on the first day mm. and then it's a quick fix on the next few days. So from a labor standpoint, actually having continuous EG is not necessarily 
worth from a tax perspective. I think it really depends on the type of EGs you use. Do you use collodium or not for longer monitoring? Do you use just paste? So there's a lot of nuances. So they are very site specific. So um, intermittent EEG, as Dr. Rossetti has done in, uh, studies on this, can be very helpful and show us the most important information. So overall, at the group level, might be just as good. But when we talk about those individual cases, they might have nuances and ch small changes that might be helpful. Perhaps it, we might miss some of those cases. So mm. more data is not doesn't mean it's better. Um, but I think this is a complex um, thing and it's very individualized. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Dr. Andrea Rossetti, thanks you for your talk and ask, do you have a clue if the EEG spectrogram may offer a clue regarding present absent background reactivity? Yeah, I think I need to be honest with you. Um, this, just looking at the spectrogram, when we are looking at very short changes on the EEG, my be difficult. You know, I have examples I showed here in the talk. They are the nice examples, right? That we look at the spectrogram and you can see it because, you know, I'm giving a talk. I'm not going to show you the majority of the cases where the spectrogram is kind of hard to, to tell. I think there is uh, a role for EG spectrograms here. Perhaps it can be helpful. And that's when I think the quantitative feature analysis might be actually more helpful than your, our eyeballs in the spectrogram because some of those changes are very small. The window to create a spectrogram, if you're gonna make the calculations, right? There's a window to make those calculations to make a spectrogram and the changes on reactivity might be very short. So because of the window we needed, we might not be able to see them just because of a resolution problem. Mm -hmm. But when we do a computational analysis of the changes, we might be able to detect those changes better. Of course, how do you link the stimulation at the bad side with the EEG, that's another difficult thing, right? How does the, the EEG is passive recording of brain waves? So how do you alert the system that actual stimulation was done? So what we do is like we make annotations on the EEG, which are imprecise, right? That's not going to be exactly necessarily when you do the stimulation. When I did a study um, that we did this prospectively, I actually had a button that I would have on my hand. So I stimulate with one and I click the button on the other. So I know a little bit more precisely when the stimulation happened. And that allow us to be more precise on the quantitative EG reactivity analysis. But that's difficult to do in real practice. But with advances in machine learning and algorithms, now we have all these different patient sensors, right? So perhaps we can connect them. I actually did as part of this reactivity study, uh, we put accelerometers on the patients and we, they use it, it's like a wristwatch. And we'd monitor the accelerometer change over time and do EG reactivity annotations whenever the accelerometer hit a certain threshold. So we're trying to automate EG reactivity assessments and do that throughout the day, right? Because doing EG reactivity assessment once a day might not be enough. We might be missing a reactivity. It turns out it didn't work. Um, even though the algorithm all looked right, pretty and nice, we had to... There are too many false positives, there's, there's too much noise, but I think that's where we're going. So even though my study didn't work, we are moving towards using this type of tool um, in the future. Hmm. Very good. Okay, next question. Um, in order to aggressively treat the ictal EEG early in the patients, how far up would you increase midazolam? I saw on your slide four milligrams an hour, but would you go even higher if the suppression is not yet achieved? For example, midazolam five to six milligrams per hour. Yeah, so I think it's very difficult to give any recommendations on seizure treatment in cardiac arrest um, because we don't know exactly um, what's the patient that might respond. Um, so it's, it's tough. You know, most patients who have seizures that have status epileptic because will have a poor outcome. So your question if it's worth treating or not. Um, so putting that aside, if it's worth treating or not, so let's ignore the disease. And our approach for treating cardiac arrest seizures is really the same as treating regular seizures, at least early on. I might not put people on pentobarb or phenobarb coma and keep them being treated for seizures for two weeks. But um, early on, I like to give the patients a shot um, and I like to be aggressive treating and that's even helpful for prognostication, to be honest with you, right? If you give your all early on, 
you can talk to the families and talk to the team and say, hey, we, we did everything we could. We were very aggressive. The patient is not getting better despite our best efforts. So I think that can be actually very helpful in conversations, um, right? It's tough when you second guess yourself on day three and you get the MRI and the MRI looks decent, but this patient has been seizing for three days and you didn't treat it. That's when you're like, oh, maybe we should have treated the seizures a little more intensively. Mm -hmm. I think I've been on both sides. You know, that's why is we need to do research in this area so we can figure this out. Because we are, we think we can individualize care, and we think we're we're trying our best to do the best for the patient. But if we don't have the knowledge about how to do that, we're often going to miss. Uh, judge and think, oh, this is a bad EG. This patient's not going to get better. But tomorrow the EG looks good. And I say, oh, maybe I should have done this. I think my approach has been to treat it. And we've given much more than four milligrams of midazolam for sure on those patients. Um, Thank you. Uh, Steven Erickson asks, do you find Persist Mobile to be useful to dashboard patients in the EEG control room? I've not used Persist mobile, I assume that's a cell phone. Um, I've seen it and I think it's nice. You know, we all want to be able to look EGs, especially when it's 2 a.m. in the morning without having to go to your office and turn on and log in. Um, so I haven't used it, so I can speak uh, for it. We used to have um, the Persist big screen where we have like mobile EGs at once. I think that was, it's nice. You know, you walk in in the EG lab and you look at the screen and say, oops, we need to check on patient two first and not check on that patient last. So I think it is a very helpful tool for me to organize my day and organize which EGs I want to prioritize. Also, the teams are all calling me at 8 a.m. in the morning asking what was the EG overnight and I have like 10 EGs to read. So I can quickly look at the spectrogram, click on the hot spots and decide, well, in the quick look, things look good or this patient is seizing. I'm gonna look at it in more carefully um, at 9 a.m. once I go through all the cases. So I think it's, a, to me, has been a helpful tool mm -hmm. uh, in, in planning the day. Yeah, and I'll just say, um, Stephen, you can reach out to us directly if you have questions or wanna know which sites are using it regularly. We're happy to answer your questions about that. Um, okay, another question. Is there any evidence in improving outcome in treating these interictal continuum patients patterns that don't meet criteria for a seizure such as two hertz GPDs? Well, I mean, there's not, one thing is evidence and one thing is data, right? So you put different pieces of data from different studies and then you create evidence. And unfortunately, as far as I know, the evidence of treating seizures altogether in cardiac arrest are, is not completely clear, much less is two and a half or two or 1.5. So um, I think we're not there yet. And I think we're moving towards um, doing it. I'm actually working on a clinical trial now for um, treatment of status epilepticus in cardiac arrest. There's a Telstar study from the, uh, the, the Twenta group that's going on in Europe, which uh, I think they finished enrollment already. So we should be getting results of that trial. And that trial was treating versus not treating seizures in cardiac arrest and, and seeing if treating it at all helps outcomes. So we'll have to see what the results of that study are going to be. Independent of the results of that study, more studies are going to be needed, right, um, to assess that. And I think the question about what's the right hurts that we should start treating patients is something that should be considered in the study design. Thank you. Okay, next question is from Denise Chen. If access to continuous EEG is limited, are there key times post-cardiac arrest during which routine sequential EEGs would be of highest yield for assessing evolution of background and reactivity? Yeah, so Do Dr. Rossetti's group has done some nice studies comparing continuous EEG with uh, intermittent EEG. I would say that um, having an EEG a day in the first two, three days is helpful. So an EEG within 12 to 24 hours or so, it's a good, um, time window to get the first EEG and repeat that on day two. And depending on the evolution of the case, um, repeat that for another day. Of course, if the patient develops seizures and other more worrisome type of patterns, you might want to convert their routine EEG to a continuous EEG if there are resources 
uh, to do so. And I think it's very important to train the techs and the, the team to do the reactivity assessment. So whenever you do have EG on, that you get that EG reactivity assessment done, because I think that can be a very helpful tool assessing the patient's trajectory. Okay, great. Okay, there's four more questions left, I think. So the next one is from Michael Lingofelt. What is the sweet spot of the data with EEG? And is there a point where there is pushback about keeping the EEG on versus usefulness of data collected? There's a theme here. This is great. No, absolutely. I think, you know, it's all about resources, right? And uh, for me, it's easier because I'm the intensivist and the epileptologist, right? So I don't, I don't need to disagree with myself. Um, <laughs> So it's usually for me, for me to be on board with myself is easier than when that's across teams. Um, so I think it really depends on resources. I think early EEG data is helpful. So EEG done during the cooling phase, if you're doing cooling, but you know, EEG in the first day and then repeating that after rewarming can be helpful. A lot of seizures emerge as you saw in the talk after rewarming. So that 24, 48, early 72 hours. So it might be helpful to have that EG on. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, epileptologists who are in charge of the monitoring service should be understanding of that type of request um, with a more early and delayed EG. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is from Liberty Simmons. Does the severity of abnormality on the MRI correlate with length of cardiac arrest time? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And it is true. The worse your time to ROSC, more likely you're going to have more brain injury in general, in your EEG, in your MRI, because the resuscitation efforts are really important. Have I seen people that are coded for more than an hour come back and be totally normal? Yeah, I did. So I don't uh, give up on people necessarily because it took them a while to be resuscitated. I've had, we have a study that's under review now, it's going to come out in about ECMO and EEG now, all those patients were in really bad shape, right? They ha had to have ACMO for a while. And we, more than half of the patients had uh, ictal iterectal continuum changes. You know, very few had seizures, actually. So most of those patients had very deranged EEGs, um, even without seizures, which just indicates that being sick and having uh, cardiovascular issues and long resuscitation problems is associated with a bad looking EG. And that's why I think brain monitoring can be very helpful mm -hmm. on those uh, patients. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, uh, Tyson Berghardt asks, is neurovascular coupling as good as autoregulation for predicting injury? Could a proxy for this be calculated as a correlation between autoregulation measures and EEG power? Yeah, certainly this is an area of investigation and there are studies um, that have been completed there is of small scale doing TCD monitoring um, and looking at the change in MAP. I think doing this integration of um, for true neurovascular monitoring is complex, right? Because you need to have a way to monitor blood flow uh, that can be invasive or non-invasive. We have to have the EG on. But those are definitely things that we are interested in doing. I mean, doing that type of analysis on traumatic brain injury patients, because those patients tend to have intracranial EEG in my shop, if you have a um, brain surgery or scalp EEG, and we have uh, CBF monitors whenever we do invasive EEG monitoring. We are not there yet for cardiac arrest, at least in, in our shop in, in at UCSF. If you go to Vancouver, they are doing uh, CBF monitoring and they are looking at this type of um, more complex um, type of monitoring. I don't remember if they've done any EEG correlation necessarily, They've been publishing so much and they've been doing such a good job that it's hard to keep up with all their work. But uh, I don't remember that comparison specifically, but I'm sure that's something we are working towards. Okay, great. And uh, are artifacts in ICU EEG recordings a problem and how do you handle artifacts? Yes, uh, certainly that's a pain of our existence, especially you know, if you're doing research and trying to do analysis and the data is not good, uh, it's hard to make the data good after. Um, so that's certainly a problem. The good thing you know, for clinical care is just a few electrodes might be good enough. So even if you have a few electrodes that are bad, you might still be able to have information that's good enough for monitoring with just a few electrodes. Great, thank you. Okay, and uh, Olga 
whose name I whose last name I can't pronounce, Suyatsky. How early do you use ketamine for management of status epilepticus in this patient population? And is there a concern for elevation of ICP with ketamine use? So the, the very good question. Uh, that's a very common concern, the ICP concern. There's a nice study um, from the Columbia group, the first authors in Miami now, looking at ICP and ketamine use in general. And that there's not doesn't seem to be a concern. We do ketamine for our TBI patients who all have intracranial monitors on. And, they've been doing okay. So that's not something I'm too worried about, the elevation of ICP with ketamine. So I think that's something that's used to be a concern, but now we have data to show that this is not as much of a problem. In terms of how early, <clears throat> I tend to use ketamine uh, not our, as our first agent. Propofol is usually the first. Uh, sometimes I'm doing ketamine before midazolam, kind of depending on the case, you know, midazolam can really, be difficult for prognostication and confounding the exam. So sometimes now we've been using ketamine earlier. So um, there's no clear guideline about when to use it. I usually do that whenever I failed with propofol. There are studies that are being designed now to use ketamine for early status epileptic treatment, not in cardiac arrest. Uh, and we're hoping that these studies are gonna be funded by the NIH. So we will have that information for early status as I'm a, I'm a fan of ketamine given their side effect profile, but I think there, there's probably a right patient population. Uh, some of the status after cardiac arrest can be very difficult to treat and you, you're, we might run out of ketamine in your hospital it, when you put the infusion at the dose you want to try to suppress the EG. So it doesn't always work on suppressing the EG. Um, so that's another concern, but we do use it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And one last question. What are some helpful tips for new EEG techs to improve chances of getting a good study? What are things we should know to help the physician in regard to the study? Sorry if it sounds silly. I don't think that sounds- Not like at all. <laughs> the, the best EEG study are the bald patients. So you need to always uh, want the bald patient without too much hair, but not, I'm <laughs> kidding. But um, I think, it, you know, in terms of getting a good study, we need to think about the patient's room temperature, right? If the patient's very sweaty, there are things that we might be able to optimize so the patient is in a better place. I think communication with the nursing team about the EEG and education is really helpful. So if you say, hey, we just put this EEG, you know, if you need to move the patient for cleaning or any procedures, just be mindful, you know, I put the EEG here, you can move it to this place. Because sometimes people are afraid of the EEG, they don't want to touch it because they think they'll break it. So if you talk to the nurse and explain how to move things around, they might actually be very helpful. Um, so I think that's a very a good thing that we sometimes we just go in and out because we have many EGs to do. But I think that communication and empowering the nurse uh, is very helpful. Getting the nurse to tell you when there's an artifact. I say, hey, the EG looks bad, you know, giving your number so they know how to reach out at 2 p.m. instead of calling you at 6.30 p.m. when you're not there anymore. So I think those are some of the things that are helpful, especially, if, and this is helpful in general, not just for cardiac arrest. Um, but those are things that we might not be top of mind when we are pl putting the EEG on that might be actually very helpful. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of helping the physician, you know, telling the nurses, as I mentioned, to click the stimulation or typing comments, if that's allowed in your uh, shop, I think that can be very helpful, right? Because how do you know the patient was stimulated, you know, as a EEG or... I cannot sit in front of the monitor and watch the video 24 seven for 10 patients, right? So it's mm -hmm. hard to know when the patient is stimulated, mm -hmm. but if people can comment when they're gonna do an exam, when the neurology team come do an exam, then I can watch the monitor more carefully the video during those times. So that can be very helpful for the epileptologist interpreting the data. So, so those are some of the things that I think are helpful. Okay. We did have one last question call, uh, come in and uh, I know you need to get going, Dr. Amarim. Um, do you have time for one more? And then this will sure, be the Sure, let's do the last one. All right, we'll cut it off after this, guys. Okay, does propofol and Kepra cause a bad study for patients in the ICU? I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Uh, I mean, mm. we, we give propofol and Kepra to people all the time um, in general. And the cardiac arrest patients, if they're developing myoclonus, Kepra can be very helpful, not just from a seizure perspective, but also from myoclonus management. If you need to... Uh, treat myoclonus. Most myoclonus you actually don't treat. Mm 
uh, if it's not uh, related to EEG changes. But sometimes the patient is not compliant with the ventilator, we might have to treat and valproic acid and capra drugs we commonly use. But I don't think of them as drugs that make the EEG look bad. Usually the EEG looks bad and that's why we give them. Mm -hmm. so I think that's usually how I think about it, not the other way around. That makes sense. Okay, that's it. I want to thank you so much for your time. This was really educational and the QA section was fantastic, just as, just as educational as the talk itself. So I want to thank you for your time. This has been really a lot of fun. Um, the recording will be made available. So stay tuned for that, everyone. And uh, we hope to see you at the next Persist Grand Round. Thank you, Dr. Amarim. Oh, thank you for having me. You have a good day, everyone. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.